A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of one's death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy flesh to be angry, for angry anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense, but the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Consider the works of God, consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider. God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that men should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous overmuch, neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise men more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. All this have I proven by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I applied mine heart to know, and to search, and to seek out wisdom, and the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even, the foolish, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman, whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions." So we see here in the beginning of the chapter, and we're going to focus in on the first ten verses there, where he talks about the better things again. Uh, the one verse that I do grab out of the second portion, I guess it's two here, it says, It is good, in verse 18, it is good that thou shouldst take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise men more than ten mighty men which are on the king. And Solomon here, as the wisest man, I believe, is arming men with that same thing, where he would give wisdom unto them so that the one could be even stronger than ten within the fort, within the stronghold. It is good that thou shouldest take hold of these things, even as Solomon is teaching them, is his emphasis. Things that are better, things that are better, better things is what we're talking about. If you were to look back in uh, Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 24, it says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, and it was from the hand of God. Across in 3.22 it says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion, for who shall bring him to see what shall be 
after him. So these are the things that are, are the best. There is nothing better than these, according to the wisdom of Solomon here. Um, but what he's going to talk about next is a few things that are, are better within the context of what's being compared unto it. The first one, verse 1, says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, now why would the good name be better? Well, my first uh, understanding, my first thing that I grasp of is that the precious ointment is not something that lasts, whereas the good name is something that not only stands the test of time while you're here, but it's something that can live on after you. That good name is something that lasts the test of time. Ointment, yes, it is precious. Yet it's, yes, it is rare. Yes, it is costly. Yes, it is valuable. And I would say even still that the good name is all of those things, but the difference is, is that the ointment has an end. It does not last forever. Now we can take of that ointment, and as long as it was preserved properly, perhaps, we could put it away, we could store it up, we could reserve it, but if the ointment is just sitting on the shelf, or the ointment is just kept in a cold storage area, it is not of any benefit to everybody. It's just something that's held in store. Therefore, that good name is something that's not only rare and costly and valuable and precious, it's something that can be used all the time and will not have an end if it's handled correctly. The ointment, rather, to be a benefit to anyone has to come out and has to be spent and has to be used. You can turn to John chapter 12 if you want to keep your finger or keep something in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You can turn to John chapter 12. What you're going to find there is the discussion, the story, the history from the Bible of the ointment being poured upon the Lord Jesus. John chapter 12 and verse 3 says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. So here Mary could have done what we just talked about. She could have taken that oil. She could have put it away. She could have held it in store. Uh, the suggestion made here from Judas was that she would take of that ointment, and we know actually from other portions of Scripture, that all the apostles were in agreement, that she should have taken that ointment and sold it and given the money thereof to the poor. But Jesus said, hey, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. Oh, she took that ointment and she spent it. She used it for the purpose, and that purpose on this day was to anoint Jesus for his burying. She could have put it away and used it as some sort of rainy day fund, but instead she used it to bless her Savior before he died. She used it to anoint his feet. And she anointed the feet of Jesus, and in comparison the ointment to the name, we know that Jesus has the name which is above every name. We know that Jesus is the name that every knee shall bow to and every tongue shall confess. So it was fitting and it was worth it and it was ointment well spent to put it upon the feet of Christ. Again, his statement there is signifying the same thing that uh, I believe Solomon is just saying, that the good name is better than the ointment. In other words, that ointment is of no value compared to that good name. That good name here in the context being Christ. And because she did this, because she anointed him in this way, you can turn to John chapter 14, or Mark chapter 14, sorry. Mark chapter 14, because Mary here blessed the Lord with the ointment that she had. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 9, you're going to find this. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And because she blessed the name which is above every name, recognizing the ointment was nil, was of no value, was of no cost, was of no price compared to the name of Jesus and compared to the reputation and compared to her beloved Savior, she herself received a name. 
She herself received a reputation as one that has done such things. And the Bible here records that wherever the gospel is preached, she shall be brought up as a memorial. She herself received a name. And it's a good name. And then in this portion of scripture, she also highlighted the next point. And the next point there, if you look at verse 8, it says, She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body for the burying. So Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 2, it says, It is, or sorry, the second portion of verse 1, it says, And the day of death than the day of one's birth. Again, it's highlighting the fact that she anointed his body with the ointment for the burial of the Savior, accentuating the fact that the focus here is upon the day of death. And that is greater than the day of birth. And maybe this is contrary to what we would think, but verse 8 even highlights this point in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. It says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning of it. So even in regard to life, that holds true, where that day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. And the reason I believe is that we, we need to be often mindful of those things. That day that is approaching, we need to be considering the fact that that day has a, a preeminence. Why? Because it's, it's ahead of us. It's approaching. We need to be thinking of that. And instead of celebrating our birth, instead of celebrating things in our past, the Bible always gives us a focus that is going forward. It gives us a focus as to what's more important. And it says here that it is better. The day of death is better than the day of one's birth. And we ought to be focusing on the same. We ought to be so focusing on, on the future and how we're going to live while we close the gap between here and our death. Verse 2, it says this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to heart. They will lay it to their heart, the living will. The house of the mourning does this, it corrects the heart of others. Those that aren't necessarily mourning, but th or those that are mourning because of the death that has passed, they have witnessed the end of all men. They are mourning, and what it does is it corrects the heart. We know the Bible records that feasts are something that are vanity. You see that in Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 1. It said, I say in my heart, go now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore endure pleasure. Behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? So we see that the celebrating, the rejoicing that often happens is in the house of feasting is vanity. It is vexation of spirit. There is nothing to it. But wisdom and correction is to be gained when you see the end of it all, when you see the end of men, when you witness somebody dead, when you see them laying perhaps in the grave, when you see perhaps them in the, in the open casket, whatever it is, there is wisdom to be gained there. Why? Because the living lay it to heart. And I often give this wisdom and myself, I try to practice it. Don't miss funerals, people. I know a lot of people get, get, get upset and they hurt and they just want to stay away from it. But as a believer, we need to understand that these scriptures are true and we believe them right so it is clear that the better thing to do the house of mourning is the end of all men and that is where the heart has something laid to it the living will lay it to heart I have been many a times taught or been able to teach when I went to a funeral and it's not a fun experience. It's not a joyful experience. But the Bible is clear. It is better to do that than to go to the house of feasting. We all want to go to the family feast. We all want to go to the family dinners. We all want to go and enjoy a great feast with friends or what so have. But to go to that house of mourning is actually better. And I've experienced it myself. There is a reason why this world has taken what is, what is commonly known as the funeral, which is something of mourning, something of weeping, something that is very, very sad and very doleful and, and, and down uh, of an experience. And they have taken that and they have changed it to something called a, a, a celebration of life, where, where we're not going to mourn, we're not going to weep, but rather, rather we are going to uh, try to hide the emotions, try to rejoice in that time, try to eat and try to feed. You're making what would be a great experience to learn, to be taught, to teach someone, and you are removing it from The Bible is clear, it's better to go to the house in the morning. But we take the house in the morning, we try to make it into a feast. It's wrong, and there's a reason why the world does it. Why? Because when you go to a funeral, a good funeral, the preacher is going to stand up, and they are going to preach you the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are going to explain to you that whether that person that is laying in that coffin is in heaven, or whether that person that is laying in that coffin is in hell, there is one truth, and that they want you to be saved. 
If they are in hell, they are pleading that you would believe. They are begging uh, people that are around them in that same experience that somebody would go to their family members, that they wouldn't go to this horrible place. If they're in heaven, they're pleading that somebody would go to their family members and they would come to heaven all the same. Regardless, that is the truth that needs to be preached. And people too often just want to sanitize their lives and want to remove any kind of negative feeling. And quite often people, I've, I've heard it said that somebody that had their husband pass away, within a week the doctors were like, you're still sad, you need to get on these medications. What in the world? There is great wisdom in mourning, and the Bible teaches that the heart will be made better. The heart will be encouraged. The heart will be strengthened. And that's in the very next verse. It says here, it says, Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. But what do we do? We take that sad heart, and we just give it drugs so it doesn't feel it anymore. We take that experience of going to the house of mourning and gaining something, and we take that away from people and rather give them a celebration of life. It's wrong. It, it, it's not going to do what it's supposed to, and your heart will not be made better. Your heart will be for the worse because of it. I've experienced it myself when I went to my, my, my grandmother-in-law's funeral, and here I was with a woman preacher standing up there, right, hearing directly from the Lord Jesus the hardest, the most personal, the most intense sermon I have ever heard ministered directly to my heart from the Word of God, in spite of the preacher, in spite of who was standing up there. Why? Because I stepped into the house of mourning, and for my grandmother-in-law, and for that woman, I went there and I opened the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and regardless of whatever that, that heathen witch was preaching up there, I heard true words preached to my heart, true words preached to my being. And I heard the best sermon I've ever heard personally from the Lord Jesus Christ in that moment. I can still take you back there. And it was fantastic. Had I just decided to ignore and to remove myself from that husband morning, I wouldn't have experienced that. And the sorrow that came after that feeling, all the emotions that were going on at that time in my life. I actually remember coming back and, and spread out in, in the driveway outside of my house, this sermon ministering to my heart continued as I poured over the Word of God, as it taught me, and as it, as it moved me, and as it gave me this great feeling. And that was, that was a pivotal, pivotal moment in my life that got me to the position where I'm at. A, a moment where I became, I became truly sold out onto the fact that I was going to stay steadfast in the way of God regardless of what was going on in my life, regardless of the situations in my life, who was with me or who was against Against me, I did not care. But in that moment, being having the scriptures in mourning, pouring over my soul, and then later on in that driveway, I can take you to the place where I just laid sprawled out. Any passerby could have seen it, hearing the word of God being teached to me. I will not change that for the world. It all started because I went to the house of mourning, and I laid what was taught. I saw the end of all men and laid what was taught to my heart. And allowed for the sorrow of the moment to take that sad countenance and make my heart better. And I was much encouraged by it. So we can either be strengthened by mourning, which is a long help, where your heart is strengthened and improved and grows greater. Or you can take laughter and celebration and try to make that into your short-term help. You can either take the pill of laughter and take the pill of celebration and take the pill of literally and, and, and just, just miss out on something so much greater. But the wise do this, verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And there's your dividing point, where, where, where either you, you are a fool and just constantly seeking after the celebration and the rejoicing, or you are wise and you are willing to go into the house of mourning, have your heart improved, have your, have your mind, will, and emotions strengthened, and be encouraged in the things of God. Solomon here says it's better. It's better to go to the house of mourning. It's better to be sad and of that countenance. These things are better for you. Why? Because it's a long-lasting help. It's a long-lasting strengthening. It's not just that pill to make your problems go away. Here we see that this mourning is something that can be either for yourself or for others. And both are experiences I believe it's good to be behind. Uh, 
the Job, right? His friends came, and the best thing that they did was to just sit with him and mourn with him in silence. Afterwards, they, they proved themselves to be not the greatest of friends when they opened their mouth. But mourning is good. It is right to go and to mourn with people. It is right to be in a state of mourning. We all go through times when we're going to experience that. Don't be so quick to try to get out of it. Just allow God to minister to you through that. That's the best advice I can give from my own experience. So don't shy away from this. Don't, don't shut, uh, shut off the, the great gain, the great growth that comes from mourning. Don't suppress it, but rather let those times strengthen you. Let God strengthen you in it and through it. It is better, verse 5, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the the song of fools. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 5 says this. It says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, this is a, a pretty clear teaching. It's, it's pretty plain to see that, that there is open rebuke, which is better than secret love. There is faithful wounds of a friend, and the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. But what it's giving you is the idea that, that almost seems contrary. Why, why would a friend wound you? Why would an enemy kiss you? Because it's explaining a, a very simple truth in that when people wound you sometimes, when they openly rebuke you, they're actually doing it out of love. I gave this illustration this week as I was, I was driven to the airport by a coworker. I explained to him as, as he was telling me that he just recently started going back to church and he decided to go to the great big mega church because they had all the programs, they had all the things going on. He was going through a really rotten time in his life and he went and he jumped into that church. I said, hey, that's fine. I'm good to see you making the right steps towards God. He grew up independent Baptist. He grew up learning the right doctrine. But now his baby step was to go into the mega church. I said, that's fine. You're going to go. You're going to get encouraged. And for a while, it's going to help you. But there's going to come a time when you want to hear doctrine. I'm like, you're going to find out that when people are constantly trying to give you good news and trying to encourage you and trying to build you up, they're lying to you. It, it, just, it just never failed, right? Because you're a man, and eventually they're going to see something wrong with you. But if your preacher is just telling you positive all the time, he's lying to you. Here's the illustration. It's this. You get out of a, a nice big dinner. You just had a smorgasbord. you got stuff all over your face. And five of your friends come up to you, and they're like, hey, man, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Good seeing you again. Everything's going great. You're looking good, man. Have a nice day. And one after another, they come, and they encourage you, and they strengthen you, and they lift you up, and they build you up, and they say you're an awesome guy. And then the preacher comes, and he's like, man, you've got stuff all over your face. You look like garbage. I mean, it's disgusting. I can't even look at you. It's so bad. And you're going to be like, oh, you're going to be wounded. What do you mean? You're going to be so hurt by that. But then the honest and just and righteous and good and loving preacher will take that napkin and say, here, man, clean yourself up. It's here. It's there. It's everywhere. And he's going to help you first by showing you the problem, then by giving you the ability where which you can clean it up. And I'm like, and you're not going to get that at that mega church. You're not going to have people tell you that you're a sinner, that you've fallen short, that you messed up last week, that this is wrong, that that is wrong, that everything you're doing two-thirds of the time is a failure, and then loving you enough to say that and then giving you the ability to clean it up. And he got that. It makes sense. He's like, yes, I'm wounded, but the wisdom of knowing what's on my face allows me to do something about it, to reach out, take that napkin, and wipe it off and clean it up. And that's what happens when you hear open rebuke. And that is much better than secret love. Open rebuke is much better than secret love because open rebuke is open love. That's what it is. It is giving you what you need to hear. It is giving you what you need to know so that you can fix it. If you got stuff all over your face, you want to fix it. You don't want to walk around like that. If you got sin in your life, you want to fix it. You don't want to walk around and live a life like that. And all that open rebuke does is it brings that to the surface. It says, hey man, you're messed up. You look bad. You're, 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 you're wrong in this. You're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. Let me help you fix it. Let me help you do something about it and that's what is loving faithful are the wounds of a friend a friend will tell you when you've messed up it'll tell you when you're wrong he will wound you it will hurt and but that same friend will be there to lift you up when you fall seven times that same friend will be that 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 second that is with you helping you keep warmth like we learned earlier in the chapters of Ecclesiastes 
You need that kind of stuff in your life. What you don't need are deceitful kisses. What you don't need is the lies of people saying, you look great, man, you're doing fine, there's nothing wrong with your lifestyle. Keep on keeping on, keep singing that song of fools, right? Keep, keep understanding that, hey, man, you were just born that way. You just follow your heart, man, just, just do what feels right for you. That is hateful, that is hurtful. That is a deceitful kiss. That's giving you something positive, right, which is the kiss, but it's just like Judas's kiss was to Jesus. It was a deception. It was a lie. It was harmful. Verse 6, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, says this, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. That crackling of thorns underneath that pot, that's just the sound of burning. That's just the sound of consumption. And when that is all burned out, there's nothing that remains but dust and ashes. That's more of the vanity that we see here. And I like how he, he follows it up and he's talking about the fools that seek after um, the, that certain song. He says the fools are the ones in the house of mirth. He says the fools are the one that are returning anything that might be mournful or sad or negative into something positive in order that they can get by. And they are just like the crackling under the pot. They are being consumed slowly and surely. And the noise that they make is just the sound of a fool burning up until eventually they are consumed and there's nothing left but the vanity revealed. So with all of these ideas that are being highlighted about the better than, there's a better than, there's a better than, he, he expresses things that seemingly aren't good for the flesh. In fact, when the flesh experiences something felt, the flesh takes that and accepts it as fact. Have you ever experienced that? Sometimes you feel something and it immediately becomes fact to you. That guy's looking at me funny. He doesn't like me. What's going on? And you accept that as fact because you felt it. That's what the flesh does. We need to control that flesh. We need to bring it into captivity of the truth that is in Christ because our flesh will lie to us. Here's another way that you might think that the flesh would lie to you. Because again, as you read this, some would think that the precious ointment would be better than a good name. Because what a name? What can you do with a name? A precious ointment? That's 300 bucks, right? That's 300 shekels. We could do so much with that. How about going to the house of feasting? That's obviously way better. Flesh feels that. Likes self. Celebrating. It likes rejoicing. We don't want to be sad. What the flesh wants is to hear that song, is to hear that mirth, is to rejoice in all these things. And all that becomes a consumption underneath the pot as it burns, just like the crackling of thorns. Our flesh does really strange things to us, and our emotions get caught up in it. Think about this. If I was to break my arm, when the doctor comes to me and grabs hold of my arm to try to reset it, my flesh is going to resist that. That hurts. That's wrong. I don't want that. I'm fine just the way I am with my arm hanging off all funny. No, but what needs to happen, what the flesh doesn't understand is that something that is temporarily harmful <laughs> is beneficial because now things can heal. Now things can mend. Now things are where they need to be. Flesh doesn't understand that. That's where we need to bring every aspect of our flesh into the captivity of the Word of God, into the captivity of the obedience unto Christ, reminding it that, yeah, mourning doesn't feel good, but it's good for you. Um, sadness doesn't feel good, but it's good for you. Learning of wisdom and of wide things doesn't always feel good. Hearing the truth speak to you doesn't always feel good, but it's good for you. And that's the truth that's contained within the scriptures. You need to remind your flesh of these things and allow your spirit to take control and to understand the better things that we need to seek after. Surely, he says in verse 7, Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. So we see that oppression leads to an unwellness, a, a, a mad mentality, mentally unstableness when you're constantly being oppressed. And that gift is one that destroys the heart. It breaks it down. It leaves it vulnerable. I think here when he says surely, he's kind of just giving a tip of the hat here to the carnal experience. He's acknowledging the fact that, yes, some of these things are going to bring you to a point where you do feel oppressed and mad. Some of these things are going to bring you to a point where you do feel destroyed and beat down. And perhaps just a tip of the hat here. Maybe someone else has more insight on verse 7, but it seems like he's just taking what's been taught in verse 1 through 6, and he's saying, yeah, I understand 
that this teaching isn't exactly what you would expect. Surely the oppression of it all is going to make you mad. Surely there's that gift that destroyed the heart. You're going to get beat down. But you need to understand that the spiritual experience is what's most important. Despite all of the feelings of oppression and madness and destruction of the heart, you need to understand there's a spiritual truth behind all of this that is greater than all this. Better than it, even. Verse 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. The end of a thing, that is when you receive of the labor. That is when you reap of the reward. That is when the purpose of it all is fulfilled. And when we're talking spiritually speaking, that is when you are saved and in glory in heaven. The end of a thing is always better for those that follow after God, for those that seek after the Lord, right? God worketh all things together for good to them that love God, to them rather called according to his purpose. The end of the thing, the end of his purpose is the better. And the patient here, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. We know that long suffering there is one of the fruits of of the Spirit. We know that it's one of the character traits in 2 Peter at the beginning in chapter 1. It says, Beside all this, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godless, godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, but he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and knoweth, and, or can't see afar off, he that lacketh these things blind, can't see afar off. And that's all I know. <laughs> but, but the Bible is clear. It's saying these things are a godly character trait that need to be in you and abound. And if they're not, then you are blinded to the truths that are in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are blinded to certain aspects of your spiritual life. And patience there is one of them. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. And when we're going through these things that are better than, like mourning and like loss and like suffering, and all of those aspects of life that flesh doesn't like, that your carnal mind does not like, that is where patience really has its perfect work. That's what, that's what James said. He said, let patience have her perfect work. Let patience work in you and, and carry you through and help you to get through these things. Why? Because patience is a virtue that is in a godly believer that builds godly character and allows you to step forth and to go onto the next level in your Christian life. But we know that proud spirit, the proud spirit, is, is that pride that goeth before destruction. There's nothing but consummation for destruction, ruin that comes when somebody is proud in their spirit. So it's clear here, it is better to be patient. It is better to be long-suffering. It is better to wait on God than it is to puff yourself up and think that you're going to get through these things. Think that you have a better way than God. Uh, Solomon here, in his wisdom, is highlighting things that are better. We should take Heed to these things. As it says, it is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. That's what it says in verse 18. Take hold of the truths. Grab a hold of them. Understand them and walk in them in patience and with understanding and with long suffering. Verse 9 says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. And the reality here is that if you're hasty in your spirit to be angry, it means that you are allowing that anger to rest in you. It means that you're not forgiving. It means that you are not long-suffering. It means that you are not being kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You are allowing for that anger to billow and to rest and to stay within your bosom. And that's why you're angry so hastily. People that are angry hastily, they're angry all the time, right? Because they're always at that boiling point. And it's a foolish way to live your life. The Bible here is clear. Be not hasty in your spirit to be angry. You need to be patient in your spirit. And if you're always angry and it's always like a hairpin and you're just ready to trigger and to blow up, you are living a foolish life. You are wrong in doing that. You need to be forgiving and allow for your bosom to be free of that anger. Don't let it billow up. Don't let it be stored up there and ready to just send you over the tipping point at any moment. Verse 10 says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? 
for thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. And what we too often do, even amongst uh, the church, is we will look back at great revivals of the past and we'll say, man, things were so great then. Here in Toronto, we could look at about one year ago when the marathon happened and everybody here seemed to be on one accord. All the church was together. There was a great fellowship and all these people were joining. Along that same time, Pastor Anderson showed up and, and hundreds went down and they watched this movie. We all went soul went together. We were in unity and we can sit here and say, well, what is the cause that those four former days were better than these. And the Bible here says that we are unwise to consider and to dwell upon those things. We're exactly where God wants us to be. We're exactly where we need to be. And what has changed has changed for the better. It is foolish for us to sit here and try to formulate what was happening then and try to recreate it now. Those days are past and we do not inquire wisely concerning this thing when we try to grab a hold of it and figure out how we can recreate it. And, and Baptists are notorious for this. They're trying to recreate last year's revival service. They're trying to recreate the great revivals that they've heard of in the past. They're trying to recreate what it was like in the 80s at you know Howes Anderson College. They're trying to recreate all of the things that they've seen done throughout history and because they're constantly doing that, they're not not in the position to move forward for God. And this is what we need to do. We need to be ready to move forward in the work of God. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 talks about this. Philippians 3 and verse 8, I'll begin reading. It says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. And here the Apostle Paul, as one of those who had a great past, who had great things, who had great notoriety, he was famous within his congregation, within the people that he ran with. He, he, had, a, he had a great job, he had great pay, he had people that, that loved him, and, and, and here he is saying that he has suffered the loss of all things. But he doesn't look back and say, well, how can I recreate that? How can I get all the Pharisees, my friends, back? How can I get all those liars and get those deceivers to be my friends, but to bring them along in my Christian fight here? How can I do that? He's not sitting there. He's saying, I count all those things, but dumb. Right? I, I'm, I'm forgetting those things. They are nothing. They are worthless to me. Why? That I may win Christ. His focus is upon Christ. And in verse 9 it says, And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, which is how he lived before, right? His past was living by the law, and it was his righteousness they tried to bring up before God. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. His purpose here highlighted very clearly that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. It's a better thing, right? He is looking at what was past and just forgetting, just counting what he had as if it were dumb, as if it were useless, as if it were trash, as if it was just waste, excrement. It's nothing to me because why? That I may know him, that I may know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the power of the new life he gave me to live today, the power of the fellowship of the sufferings that I'm able to partake in with him. Think about it, people. We're not ever going to fellowship in, the, in, in Christ's Godhood. We're not ever going to fellowship in Christ's sinlessness. We're not ever going to fellowship in doing of miracles with Christ. There are so many things that have this great expense between us and Christ, whereby we will never fellowship with him in that way. But we can fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. And imagine what the heart can do when you are knit with Christ, going through something difficult, as I was when I was laid out, sprawled out on that driveway, as I was when I was uh, in one ear, out the ear with that woman preacher, but God was speaking to me through his words. In those moments when I'm mourning, in those moments when I'm suffering, in the moments when I'm going through some trials is when the fellowship of his sufferings brings me to a point where I am even conformable unto his death, where I just can't even imagine anything else that would be necessary. I could just die now because I have fellowship in the sufferings of of Christ. That's where we can meet with him. That's where we can commune with him. And that's where we can know him. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. Right? The Apostle Paul, I haven't made it. I haven't attained. I'm not there yet. I, I, haven't, I haven't arrived. He says, but that I might 
no, follow after. Follow after what? Knowing him. If that I may apprehend for that which I am also apprehended. If I may get a hold of Christ that's gotten a hold of me. If I can reach him. If I can fellowship with him. If I can know him on that deep and personal and spiritual and real level. That's what I'm following after. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. He says, I don't have it all figured out. I don't know everything. I don't know how to walk this life. I don't know how to talk this. I don't know how to be like Christ. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He, rec he recognized that the calling of God is greater than all that he had before. He recognized that the prize is worth leaving behind all that he had before. He's forgetting it. He's reaching forward. He's going to forget it and reach forward. Following after what? That he might know Christ. Following after that the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, the things that he is going through are so much more pertinent, so much more important important that he's going to press towards those things. He's going to seek after the highest calling which is in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers of me and mark them which walk so as ye have, for an example. And this is what he's saying here. He's saying that, hey, we have examples. You have me for an example. You have experience for an example. You have Christ for an example. You have the Word of God for an example. And the example is this, that you need to be seeking after those things, following after those things, and seeking a righteous life and a righteous end of it all. And verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven. And that's the purpose. That's the goal. That's the end of all these things. Our conversation is heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. If we're focusing too much on things of the earth, if we're focusing too much on, on our problems, on our woes, on our concerns, on our things, we are going to miss, we are going to forget about the fact that there is a high calling, which is to abide in Christ, which is to live with Him, which is to fellowship with Him in His sufferings and to go through these things. You're going to go through times when you are mourning. You are going to go through times when you are sad. You are going to go through times when you are hearing rebuke, when you are being chastened, when you are being corrected by God. But you need to understand that these things are better for you. You need to understand the end purpose is that you would have that high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. The end is that you would have affections in heaven, and that's where you need to set your focus. This is what we need to understand. Too often we let the flesh control us. We let the flesh speak louder than the spirit. We let our flesh dictate where we're going to go, what we're going to do. What we need to do is understand that there are better things than this world has to offer. There are better things than your friends have to offer, than your past has to offer, than all those things that you may look back upon and try to grab a hold of them, maybe for good reasons. You're trying to bring family members forward. You're trying to bring rebellious friends forward. You're trying to do certain things that were in your past that you want to bring along with you. The best thing we can do is day by day just release that baggage. The past is past. Leave it alone. Consider it. But dumb. Why? Because the past will just do that. It will just baggage you down. It will just weigh you down. It will just control you, manipulate you. Your feelings, your sentiment about something that was past is going to grab a hold of you. It's going to distract you from the prize, from the high calling, which is in God, in Christ Jesus, from the focus of things that are above, not things on the earth. You need to have that right focus. You need to understand that there are things that are better. You understand that the blood of Christ in that New Testament speaketh of better things than that of Abel, and you need to press on. You need to seek those things which are above. You need to move forward in the same way that the Apostle Paul gave you examples, in the same way that the Word of God gives you examples, in the same way that you can grab hold of examples in your life where you're at. You need to focus things going forward. You need to move forward. And the best thing that we can do is to not ask ourselves that silly and foolish question, what are the reasons? Why is the former days better than these? You're not wise concerning this. Why? Because God also, believe it or not, has you on that upward plane. He has you on that upward road. And just because your mind thinks something is better in the past, and just because your heart is drawn to something that was in the past, and just because you're thinking that what was back there was better, the reality is, is that's a lie. What's better is before you. 
for each one of us individually. What's before us is better for us as a church. What's before us is better for even the nation, the body of believers, spiritual Israel. What's before us is better. Therefore, don't grasp hold of these things. Remember that though we're going through some things, that's where we can find fellowship with God. And though we're going through sufferings, that's where our heart can be made stronger. We can rejoice in those sufferings. We can move forward for the cause of Christ and be better for it because everything else is just a lie. It's just dumb.